Hi, good afternoon. And I am back, Jen Wagner, to teach you a little bit more of chemistry. Today we're going to do bonding formulas and equations. And we're going to do this pretty quickly because we only have two hours to go over something that's really conceptual. So if you're not hearing this live and you need help, please get in touch with me and email me and we will work things out. Okay, there are basically two types of energy in physics. And they are the two general categories of energy. One is potential energy and the other is kinetic energy. Potential energy is the kind of energy that we talk about most in, in chemical bonds. So when we talk about molecules that are bonded, we say that a molecule as it exists contains potential energy. The potential energy associated with a, is, is, with a molecule is associated with its structure or with the arrangement of the chemical particle. This energy is the type of energy that has to do with the number and type of atoms and their arrangement in bonds. And it will change as particle arrangements change. So one of the ways that you can change the potential energy of a substance is you could heat it. If you heat it into, a, a, so for instance, if you heat it from a solid to a liquid, the liquid form of that substance will have more potential energy because the particles are within the liquid are arranged differently than they are within the solid. And of course, particles of a gas have the most kinetic energy for a substance because the, of their arrangement, which is different from both a liquid and a solid. Um, however, Potential energy changes when you're heating a substance and the temperature is remaining constant. And we'll talk more about that in the next lecture when we do solids, liquids, and gases. Kinetic energy, on the other hand, is the energy that is associated with movement, hence the word kinetic. And because it is associated with the random movement of the particle, kinetic energy is very related to temperature. So if temperature increases, kinetic energy will increase. And if temperature decreases, kinetic energy will decrease. However, if temperature is not changing, the kinetic energy is not changing at all. At any given instant, any chemical substance will have both potential and kinetic energy. When that substance undergoes some physical or chemical change, its kinetic and potential energies will be lost or gained. Even though there is always a conservation of energy, which means that if a substance loses energy, that energy needs to go somewhere. And if a substance gains energy, that energy needs to come from somewhere. So in terms of this, there are two kinds of reactions. Both reactions involve what's called delta H. Delta H is the enthalpy or the heat of the reaction. And delta H, delta meaning change in, refers to the change of heat when a reaction occurs. That change of heat could be in one of two directions. And when we refer to the change in heat, we are referring, of course, to the surroundings and not the substance. And so if a reaction absorbs heat, the surrounding area will, will become cooler because the heat will go into the reaction. However, if the reaction releases heat, that heat will go into the environment, making the surrounding warmer. So reactions that release energy to the surroundings are called exothermic. And when we look at the potential energy of an exothermic reaction, we see that the substance involved, the reactants, start out with a certain amount of potential energy, which we'll put right there. Sorry. And then they will increase as the reaction goes on, but in the end, ultimately decrease. So you can see here that the potential energy of the reactants is more than the potential energy of the products. That gap in energy is the amount of energy that is released from the reaction. That energy will go into the environment, making it warmer, as in a hand warmer or a boot warmer. On the other hand, some reactions absorb energy. Reactions that absorb energy from the surroundings are referred to as endothermic. And those reactions have a potential energy curve that looks like this, where this represents the energy gap, and it has to come in from the environment, making the environment colder, as in um, one of the ice packs, the kind of ice pack that you shake up. So why do bonds form? Well, in order to understand what, what kinds of bonds form and why certain bonds form between different atoms, we have to first think about what causes a bond to form in the beginning. And one of the general concepts or rules of chemistry is that in chemistry, particles always want to be as stable as they can possibly be. Stable means lower energy. And so in order for a bond to form, it must increase the stability of the atoms, meaning that if the two atoms are not more stable or in a lower energy state when they're together, they will not combine, which is why some things will not bond. So when a bond forms to increase stability, that bond formation must be exothermic always. The reason that it must be exothermic is that in order for the bond to increase stability, energy has to leave. 
a bond only forms when the two things are more stable than they were apart. Um, often a good analogy for this is to think about relationships. Relationships that last are relationships that are stable, and relationships that are stable don't require a lot of energy to stay together. This means that, that the compound, the couple, the grouping together must have less energy on the whole than each individual piece of that particle had before it formed. You can see that in a chemical, rea in, in a chemical reaction because you can see, for instance, in the bond formation of fluorine, that the energy is on the right, meaning the energy is going out of the reaction, making it endothermic. Similarly, the hydrogen below it also is releasing energy, and that's an endothermic process. Now, due to conservation of energy, if I want to break the bond, I'm going to have to add back the energy that was released when it formed. And so, all bond dissociation or bond breaking is endothermic, meaning energy has to be added and so the energy here appears on the left of the equation, meaning it has to come in. So what makes two things more stable when they come together? And the answer is pretty much a general concept called the octet rule. The octet rule says that most elements want to have eight valence electrons. Now remember from last time, the valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost shell. Those are the electrons that generally bond. And so most atoms on the periodic table are looking to have eight valence electrons. How will they get those eight valence electrons? Well, that will dictate what type of bond, but they're all looking for eight valence electrons. Noble gases, which already have eight, are therefore inert. That's why they don't bond. They're, they don't bond because they already have eight, and so bonding will not make them more stable or in a lower energy state than they already are. But other atoms can become more stable if they are to get the same configuration as a noble gas. Now, as you can see from the slide, there's also a part of the octet rule that talks about duets. Duets are for very small atoms, specifically the smallest of atoms, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron, the first five atoms. Those first five atoms, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron are most stable when they have two valence electrons. That is because they are small atoms that, relatively speaking, have one shell, and that one shell of electrons is full, the first shell, with only two. So really, I could rephrase the entire octet rule into every element on the table is looking to have a noble gas configuration. For elements that are closer to helium, that noble gas configuration is two valence electrons, but for elements that are larger than helium, that noble gas configuration will involve eight valence electrons. There are three ways to get what you want if you're an atom, and those three ways are metallic bonding, ionic bonding, and covalent bonding. Metallic bonding exists between atoms of metals. Metallic bonding only exists between atoms of metals. And what I mean by that is these are going to be one single metal, as in an iron nail, or a group of metals that have been mixed, such as brass or bronze or 14 karat gold. In metallic bonding, the valence electrons of each metal are lost to the general valence C. And that might sound more complicated than it is. Metallic bonding, metallically bonded atoms exist as crystals, so they're mostly in a solid form at normal temperatures. And in those crystals, the metals will give up their electrons. We talked in the last lecture about ionization energy and how metals have low ionization energy because the best metals are the largest atoms that are most likely to give up electrons. Another facet of being a metal is that they generally have very few valence electrons, one or two or three, and three is a rarity, mostly one or two. When you only have one or two valence electrons and you want eight, the best thing to do is often to get rid of the one or two that you have because then you'll get eight in the shell beneath. So metals like to lose. They are the big losers of the table. When a metal loses its electrons, the metal will become a positive kernel. The positive kernel will be the nucleus with the protons and the non-valence electrons in the cloud around it, but no valence electrons. Since the kernel has lost its valence electrons, it will always carry a positive charge. Those positive kernels will arrange themselves into a crystal structure, some sort of geometric pattern, so to speak. And 
the electrons that they have given up will become part of a C that acts like a glue that holds all of the metal atoms together. We say in this case that the valence electrons of a metal become delocalized, meaning they are no longer owned by any one metal and they're floating randomly around in a C that encompasses all of the positive kernels. Why does it encompass all the positive kernels? Well, because the positive kernels will be naturally attracted to those negative electrons that are floating around. In general, when we talk about those negative electrons floating around, we can't tell where those electrons originally were. So any electron that has entered this delocalized C is no longer the property of the element to which it originally belonged. And that's why we call it a C. That C of mobile electrons and that th their mobility as they move around because they're attracted to all of the positive kernels gives a metal all of its properties. For instance, it's crystalline and there's a lot of electrostatic attraction between these positive kernels and the negative electron C and that will give it a high melting point. In addition, those mobile electrons make it a great conductor of heat and electricity. By the way, mobility of your electrons, or in other words, in, in general, in a more general sense, mobility of charge, in this case electrons, mobility of charge actually is what causes something to be a conductor. And so these mobile C of valence electrons are going to allow metals to conduct in any phase. And that's why we call them true conductors. They're also malleable and ductile. Malleable means that if I hit it with a hammer, it will bend or dent, but it will not break. Ductile means it can be rolled into wires. These are two properties that are standard properties of metals. The reason that they exist is due to their metallic bonding. When you put pressure on a metal, its positive kernels should come closer together and then repel. But the negative C of electrons will allow the positive kernels to start to repel, but will then keep them joined together as the positive kernels get attracted to those negative electrons. That's why metals can be shaped. Luster. Luster has to do with shine, and shine has to do with the mobility of electrons. Um, in physics, there's something called the photoelectric effect, and that's actually a better example of how, why things shine. But to make it a very oversimplified, metals shine because when, you, when light is shined upon them, their electrons start to move even more. Next up is ionic bonding, and ionic bonding exists between metals and nonmetals. There are three types of ionically bonded compounds. They are a metal bonded to a nonmetal, a polyatomic ion bonded to a nonmetal, or a polyatomic ion bonded to a polyatomic ion. And so I will talk a little bit more about those when we talk in general about formula writing. But so ionic bonding is all about the transfer of electrons. In an ionic bond, one of these species, one of the atoms, one of the elements has lost electrons and the other has then gained them. Uh, it, Ionically bonded solids exist as crystals, and that those crystals are inherently different from metallic crystals, though. The difference between an ionic crystal and a metallic crystal is that a metallic crystal contains all of these positive kernels in a sea of mobile electrons. The ionic crystal contains positive ions, which have lost electrons, we call them cations, negative ions, which have gained electrons, we call them anions, and there's an electrostatic between the opposite anion and cation charges that keeps the crystal together. What that means essentially is that once the crystal of the ionic crystal is established, there are no moving electrons. The electrons move before the crystal is established. And so any properties that a metallic substance has that are related to its moving electrons, an ionic substance will not have. For instance, an ionic substance is not a conductor. It is, however, an electrolyte which means that because it contains charged entities, if you dissolve it in water and make it aqueous, the movement of the water allows the charged ions to move and that movement causes conductivity. That's why we as humans can be struck by lightning because we have a lot of ionically bonded salts that are dissolved in our bloodstream. As such, we have ions moving in our bloodstream and that allows electrical charge to be conducted through our bodies. On the other hand, ionic bonds can also be conductors when they're melted. And that's because the melting process allows the ions, cations and anions, to start moving past each other. Again, creating a situation where there's moving charge and that moving charge will conduct electricity. The general term for this is an electrolyte. 
unlike a conductor, which can conduct always. And electrolyte is a little bit light on its ability to conduct and can only conduct in certain phases, specifically as a liquid or in aqueous solution, but never as a solid. Also due to the fact that the, ion, that the electrons are not mobile in an ionic compound, if you hit it, it is brittle, more like glass than a metal. And so because when you hit it and put pressure on it, the negative and positive charges will line up so that we end up with negative, 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 positive, positive, positive. They will cause a crack that will cause brittleness that will basically separate the crystal. Um, all ionic compounds are called salts, and like metallic crystals, ionic crystals have a high melting point. High melting point is a characteristic of a crystal. Anything that is in crystalline form and has a regular repeating geometry is going to have a high melting and boiling point. Finally, we have covalent bonding. Covalent bonding exists between nonmetals, and covalent bonding is what holds polyatomic ions together. We'll talk more about that when we do naming in a little while. But ionically bonded molecules Ionically bonded, uh, sorry, ionically bonded substances are called salts. Covalently bonded substances are called molecules. When you see the word molecule in a question, it is therefore always about a covalently bonded substance. Whereas when you see the word ionic in a question, it is about an ionically bonded substance. Most covalently bonded substances are non-crystalline and many of them are gases and liquids. Some are solids. If they're solids, they will be soft. They're characterized by a sharing of electrons between the nonmetal atoms. These nonmetals have more like four or five or six valence electrons. And when you have four or five in particular, you're best to share electrons in order to get your eight because you're, um, you, you don't want to be too charged as an ion. You know, ions that have a charge that's greater than three are, are going to be less stable than ions that have a charge of one, two, or three. So these electrons that they're sharing could be shared equally or they could be shared unequally. When the electrons are shared equally, we call it a nonpolar covalent bond. The word nonpolar refers to the fact that neither side of the bond is better able to control the electrons. Whereas in a polar covalent bond, one side of the bond has a higher electronegativity and is therefore able to attract the electrons a little bit better. You can see in the diagram down here at the bottom that in a nonpolar molecule, as in this one, in a nonpolar molecule, as in the molecule on the left here, you see an even spread of the electron cloud, whereas in a polar molecule, you definitely have more of a concentration on one end of the molecule than the other, making one end of the molecule, that end of the bond, a little bit more positive or negative. One way, um, and also these are not crystals, and because they're not crystals, they have lower melting points, and they are poor conductors in every phase. One way that we can determine what type of bond something has is by using something called electronegativity difference. Electronegativity difference is referred to as ED. And the electronegativity difference, it can be looked upon, up on a chart. When you look it up on a chart, you're just basically going to look up the two elements, write down their electronegativities and subtract them. This is an absolute value, so it doesn't matter which element you put first. Um, electronegative difference, if it's greater than 1.7, refers to an ionic bond, but a covalent bond would be less than 1.7. However, if the covalent bond is less than 0.4, we would refer to it as a nonpolar covalent bond, whereas if the electronegative difference is between 0.4 and 1.7, we refer to it as a polar covalent bond. Um, this is really a continuum, and so we would say that the higher something goes in electronegative difference, the more polar it becomes. So if I talk about electronegative difference with the highest being four and the lowest being zero, as the electronegative difference increases, so does polarity. Oh, I'm writing too low on the screen, sorry about that. So the higher the electronegative difference gets, the more polar the substance becomes. Okay, and that, just to point out, that is what these diagrams at the bottom over here, here, and here are showing you. The first one, the metallically bonded one, shows you all the positive kernels that have lost their valence electrons, and the blue dots refer to the sea of mobile electrons that give it its conductivity and other properties. Whereas the crystal in an ionically bonded substance has both positive and negative ions, no moving electrons. The electrons have already moved. 
On the other hand, a molecule is a very much, small, much smaller and concise unit. And so in molecules, you have what is a sharing that is actually an attachment between the two things that are sharing the electrons. Okay. Most, um, one of the ways that we can visualize a molecule is to draw a Lewis structure. And last lecture, I talked about how to draw electron dot diagrams for the different elements. Now we're going to put them together. Drawing a Lewis structure is much easier for an ionic substance than a covalent substance. So I'm going to start with the ionic substances. An ionic Lewis structure is going to show that the electrons were transferred. So for instance, if I wanted to do something like sodium chloride, I would look at sodium on the periodic table and see that sodium has one valence electron and its natural charge is going to be plus one. When it gains a plus one charge, the sodium has lost its electron. So in a Lewis structure, I would write sodium plus with no electrons. The chlorine, on the other hand, starts out with seven electrons. but it gains sodium's electron and therefore gains a negative charge. To show that all of the electrons in this molecule belong to the chlorine, I'm going to put brackets around it and put the negative charge outside of the brackets. And that is an appropriate Lewis structure for sodium chloride. Now, you might be thinking, what if it's got more than two ions in it? And so let me erase that quickly and I will do one that has more than two. So let's do um, L I two of. Lithium also has one valence electron. And on the other hand, oxygen, so we have lithium with one valence electron. Oxygen has six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Therefore, we need two lithiums to give oxygen its eight. So oxygen won't bond with one lithium because it won't become more stable nor if it does, and so it will not be an exothermic bonding and therefore it won't occur. But oxygen will bond with two lithiums. This lithium will give its electron to oxygen as will this one. Then the oxygen will get eight and the lithiums will have what they want, which is two because they are small atoms. If I wanted to write that as a Lewis structure, I would write my oxygen first in the middle. One, two, three. Let me do this again, sorry. I'm writing too low. I'm going to write it up here. Okay, so let's say we have oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, six electrons. And it will get one electron from this lithium. And it will get another electron from that lithium. And then it will have its eight minus two. And that's how I would draw lithium two oxide. Um, when you're looking at this, the reason that the lithiums have to go on opposite sides is because two lithiums together would not occur in a crystal since the positive charges would repel each other. Both lithiums, however, would be attracted to the negative oxygen. And so we have to separate like charges when we draw crystals. Okay, now we're going to do the molecular Lewis structures. Molecular Lewis structures are significantly harder to do. And so I'm going to do one on this page with you, and then I will actually do a second or third on the whiteboard. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do here is count all of our valence electrons. Um, and then we find what is a central atom, and we make a skeleton. So in order to accomplish that, I'm going to give you an example. Let's do CCl4. Carbon is a nonmetal. Chlorine is a nonmetal. They, they will combine two nonmetals covalently to make a molecule. So count all the valence electrons. In CCl4, carbon has, if you look it up on the periodic table, its last shell will have four electrons. So carbon is four electrons plus the chlorine has seven, but there are four chlorines, so that will be four times seven. And that's a total of 32 electrons. That's number one. And the reason we need to have that number is because that's the number we need to get back to. The single biggest mistake I see students make all the time is they don't bother with that. They follow the other rules and then they never go back and count. And that's where they make their mistakes. You have to have a, a number to go back to later. So 
I'm going to find the central atom, which is going to be carbon because it's always carbon. If carbon wasn't there and you weren't sure, you can look up the electronegativities on a table and the le least electronegative element would be the one in the center. But it's worth mentioning that hydrogen can never be in the center because hydrogen, which only gets a duet, can only form one bond. Since it can only form one bond, it can't be central in a molecule. Anything that's central in a molecule needs to be able to form at least two bonds. Okay, so I'm going to draw my skeleton. My skeleton is going to be my carbon in the middle and four chlorines around it. And there it is, my skeleton. Now I'm going to give each pair of atoms a single bond. A single bond is represented as a line, and that line stands for two electrons. Sometimes instead of drawing a line, you could actually draw the two electrons. It doesn't really matter. Okay, now I'm going to fill in the octets for all atoms except hydrogen, which only gets two, and there is no hydrogen, so we need eight for all electrons. So let's start with the C in the middle. Each one of those bonds is worth two, so that's two, four, six, eight. That gives C eight valence electrons already. I can leave it alone. It's all done. But the chlorines only have two each, so I'm going to have to give them another six. And now I'm going to recount. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32. And if my count equals my initial number, I'm done. So that is the correct Lewis structure for carbon tetrachloride. And I want to do more of those. So as time allows, I am going to go back and do some more of those problems on the whiteboard. If I don't have time during this lecture to do more, I absolutely will. I will just do them during um, extra help. I believe I have an extra help session tomorrow, so I will spend some time on that tomorrow. Okay, molecular polarity. So we just talked about polar covalent bonds and nonpolar covalent bonds, and we talked about electronegative difference as the defining variable in that, and it is. When I'm asked about polar covalent bonds or nonpolar covalent bonds, then I have to deal with um, the electronegative difference. However, molecular polarity is an incredibly important concept in chemistry. Molecular polarity has to do with shape of the molecule. Every molecule has a shape, and i um, sure that you remember from bio, proteins actually work because of their shape, and so do enzymes. Enzymes are proteins. Hormones. Hormones are proteins. DNA and RNA have proteins on them. Um, neurotransmitters are proteins. All antibodies are proteins. All of those things work because they have somewhat of an act, something of an active site, and the active site has a specific shape, and that allows their specificity. So shape becomes incredibly important in all aspects of chemistry. Shape is also really important in any kind of drug chemistry, like when we're working on finding drugs for um, treatment or cure of, of, of specific illnesses. Those medications need to have a shape that will allow them to function in the body and that will also prevent them from doing damage. Because, for instance, we have things like snake venom. And snake venom, with its shape, is a shape that allows damage to be done in the body. Anyway, shape is like incredibly, incredibly important. I can't emphasize that enough. And that's one of the reasons that shape is important is because shape determines whether something can dissolve in water or not. We will revisit this when we talk about solution chemistry. Um, but I'll say it once now. For something to dissolve in water, it must be polar because water is polar, and that's the way that solubility goes. So, again, molecules are very important in terms of their shape, and that shape can either make the molecule polar or nonpolar. The shape of a molecule is not determined by its bonds. It's determined by the arrangement of the bonds. So even if you have all polar covalent bonds in a molecule, those polar covalent bonds in the molecule will actually not determine whether or not the molecule is polar. For a molecule to be polar, it needs to have an uneven distribution of charge. So for instance, um, the way that I would explain this is if, well, I will try to explain it this way. I can't because I'm not going to be big enough on the screen. The way that I would explain this is that if I was in the center and I gave a rope to somebody directly in front of me and I asked them to pull on it, I would go forward. So if I'm an element that is bonded to another element that is more electronegative, when the more electronegative element pulls, the electrons are going to pull that way. If the electrons can be pulled that way, 
we would say that that is a polar molecule and that the way the electrons are being shifted is the negative end. That negative end will be a permanent concentration of negative, but it will not be negative in the ionic sense because none of the electrons have actually been lost or gained. It's just that the electrons spend a little bit more time on the more electronegative element. Again, if I want to put it in, in the perspective of relationships, I could say, you know, the, that sometimes the kids spend a little more time with one of their parents, but the parents are still sharing them. Now, if I have two elements that are more electronegative than the central atom, but I put one strategically exactly in front and the other strategically exactly in back so that they're 180 degrees from each other, if both of those elements have the same electronegativity, even though both of those bonds would be polar, they will offset each other. The central element will not be pulled in either direction, and we will call it a nonpolar molecule despite its polar bonds. If I then were to add a third bond to the right so that I'd have one in front, one in back, and one to the right, the central atom would get pulled toward the right, again being a polar bond in a polar molecule. But if I were to add a fourth polar bond so that they would all be 90 degrees apart, the central atom would not move and I would have a pol all polar bonds in a nonpolar molecule. So polarity of the bond does not determine polarity of the molecule. Pol shape determines the polarity of the molecule. If a molecule has polar bonds but it has a symmetric shape, the symmetry of the molecule will make it nonpolar. So, Nonpolar molecules, by virtue of being nonpolar, must have symmetry. Polar bonds, on the other hand, are going to have some sort of asymmetric shape. Polar molecules must have polar bonds because something that has only nonpolar molecules will, in fact, be nonpolar. But polar molecules have to have polar bonds that are in a shape such that one side has a concentration of electrons, making it a permanent positive pole and the other a permanent negative pole. Neither side is actually negative or positive, as I stated. But there are two ways to determine that a bond is polar. Uh, um, sorry. There are two ways to determine that a molecule is polar if it has polar bonds. The first one is that the central atom of the molecule has an unshared pair of electrons, as in... N, H, three. This central atom, the N, has two unpaired electrons on it. Anything with unpaired electrons on the central atom is always going to be a polar molecule. The other way to be a polar molecule is to have different members attached, such as H, C, N. Because the H and the N are two different elements, they cannot offset each other, and so that will be a polar molecule. On the other hand, a nonpolar molecule is a molecule that has nonpolar bonds, such as O2. Those are nonpolar bonds. The molecule will obviously be nonpolar. Or a molecule like CCL4 from the previous page. If I go back to the CCL4, you can see that even though those are all polar bonds, those CLs are offsetting each other, and that would be a nonpolar molecule. The polarity of bonds and the polarity of molecules ultimately is important for intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are the forces that will hold molecules together. But I'm going to digress for a moment there, and I want to just do some more molecules for you. What I'd like to do right now is to practice um, a little bit of molecule writing. And so when I practice this, I'm going to draw the molecules and then we'll determine whether they're polar or nonpolar by their shape. So let's start with something like um, H2O. H2O. I have two H's, each with one valence electron, and I have one O with six valence electrons for a total of eight valence electrons. 
the O will be in the middle because H cannot be in the middle. And so I'm going to write my O in the middle and my skeleton will have H's on the sides. Now I'm going to give one bond to each pair. And now I'm going to fill in the octets. H doesn't get an octet, H gets duet and it's already there. The oxygen, however, needs eight and has four right now. So we have five, six, seven, eight. And so that is going to be two, four, six, eight valence electrons, and that means my molecule is correctly drawn. Oxygen has two lone pairs of electrons on, and oxygen is in the center. And so those two lone pairs of electrons will in fact bend this molecule to, to the classic water that you may already know looks like this. And that will make it polar. Those two unpaired electrons, and I don't need two pairs, I only need one set of unpaired electrons, makes this polar bonds, polar molecule. So this is a polar covalent bond, and this is a polar covalent bond, and the overall is a polar molecule. So now let's do CO2. 1C times four valence electrons. plus two O's times six each is 16 electrons. So I'm going to draw my C in the middle and my O's around it. I'm going to follow my directions and my directions are going to tell me to put one of each here and to fill in the octet. So C has two, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the O's have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And now when I recount two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, I am four over. That structure is four over, so it cannot be right. Every two electrons you're over means a double bond. And so four over would mean either one triple or two doubles. Because those are both oxygen, I'm going to go with two doubles because it'll balance the molecule out a little better. And molecules are all about balance because balance reduces, let me get rid of that, are all about balance because balance reduces energy. So C, O, O. Now that double bond is worth two. So the C gets two, four, six, eight. So the C doesn't need any more electrons. Oh. And so I can fill in two more for each O. And now the O's have eight. And that is two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, which is the correct number. That's the correct structure. Now both of these are polar covalent bonds. Yet this molecule as a whole has no lone pairs on the central atom. The lone pairs are only on the ends and that's irrelevant. And so the molecule as a whole has two oxygens at either end, which will offset each other, making this a non-polar molecule. I'm going to try to do two more. Let's do two more. Let me just quickly do that. While I'm quickly erasing, I'm just going to mention to you that these are molecules and polarity has to do with molecules. So polarity is not involved in metallic and ionic bonding because they are not in fact molecules. Um, ionic and, and metallic things though are, are naturally polar because they have negative and positive forces um, involved in the nature of their bond. For instance, there are the positive kernels and the negative electrons moving in a, in a metallic crystal. In the ionic crystal, it has ions of opposing charge. Okay, so moving on. I'm going to do two more relatively easy ones. Let's do um, HBr. There's one H for one valence electron, and there's one Br worth seven valence electrons for a total of eight. So HBr. H is done, it has its two, the BR needs eight. I'm gonna fill that in, two, four, six, eight. We are good, and this is a polar covalent bond, making this a polar molecule. There is nothing on the other side to offset. However, if I were to do N2, N2 nitrogen has five, so this is gonna be a 10 electron deal. I would write it like this. And this would be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. I am four over. I can't have two double bonds because I only have two atoms. And that indicates the classic nitrogen triple bond. And there's my 10. 
this is nonpolar as a molecule because this is a nonpolar covalent bond. And so anything with just nonpolar covalent bonds or something that offsets each other will be nonpolar molecules, but polar molecules have polar bonds. Okay, so to summarize briefly before I go back to that, I'm just going to give you a brief analogy. Okay, so my brief analogy here is, is going to be pretty much about relationships. I told you before that we can kind of look at bonding as a relationship because it is a relationship um, and that the relationship itself won't form unless it's going to be more stable. But to carry that analogy a little further, ionic bonding is like an electrostatic attraction. It's like what we would call chemical attraction. It's like what happens to people when they first meet each other and date. And most of those relationships don't last forever. Ionic bonding is kind of like a situation that occurs that doesn't have to last forever. As a matter of fact, when you put an ionically bonded substance into water, it will break up because it, each of them will be attracted to the water. And the fact that the ions break up in the water is specifically why it's an electrolyte. Covalent bonding, on the other hand, is more like a marriage where they're sharing, but not necessarily equally. You know, somebody sometimes makes more money, somebody takes more, better care of the kids. And so there's a lot of different kinds of covalent bonding, just like there's a lot of different kinds of marriages, all, all in which something is being shared, but maybe not as evenly as others. A nonpolar covalent bond would be a marriage in which everything is shared right down the, the, the whole way. Whereas polar covalent bonds are going to be bonds where things are shared a little bit unequally. A very polar covalent bond will be very unequal. And if it gets polar covalent enough, it will be so unequal that the next step would be to become ionic and break up. Metallic bonding, on the other hand, is kind of like a, a commune sort of mentality where everybody's kind of sharing everything. In this case, they're all sharing those moving electrons. Okay. So... To move back to intermolecular forces, the entire discussion of polar and nonpolar molecules for our purposes is really to go into um, intermolecular forces, which I'm going to call IMFAs from now on. And so you can see here that um, I've written IMFAs. IMFAs are not bonds. Even though hydrogen bonding is a misnomer, IMFAs are not bonds. You've got metallic, ionic, covalent bonds in strength. And if they were up here, ionic, covalent, metallic, all the way down here, starts the intermolecular forces. So these are truly not bonds, but they are attractions that are so important, particularly in biochemistry, that they are worth a big mention. Well, um, I don't know if you remember this, but I will say it. Uh, RNA and DNA are held together. The double-stranded DNA is held together by weak hydrogen bonding. We call it weak hydrogen bonding, but the truth is it's not bonding. It is hydrogen attractions. And so the carbon phosphate backbone of the RNA and DNA is actually covalently bonded together. That's not weak. That doesn't come apart unless you high heat it to, to dissociate the bonds. But the hydrogen bonding in the middle is actually just an attraction that the two strands for, have for each other. It's almost like the difference between Velcro and being stitched together. So there are three intermolecular forces, and they are dependent on polarity. And so the first thing I'm going to tell you is that you have to decide, before you can decide what kind of IMFA something has, you have to decide, is it, a, is it a polar molecule or is it a nonpolar molecule? If it is a polar molecule, it has to be hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole. If it is a nonpolar molecule, it is automatically van der Waals forces. So... Let's talk about the hydrogen bonding and the dipole-dipole first. So your first decision here, you should think of this as like a dichotomous key. Your first decision is polar molecule, nonpolar molecule. And don't remember, that has nothing to do with the bonds. The bonds are electronegative difference. We're talking about the shape of the molecule now. Polar molecule, nonpolar molecule. If it's a polar molecule, then we have to ask ourselves, does it contain an H bonded to an F, an H bonded to an O, or an H bonded to an N? If it contains one of those things, then it is hydrogen bonding. Now make no mistake, H2 is not hydrogen bonding. It does not have an H attached to an F, an H attached to an O, or an H attached to an N. 
Some molecules contain NH and an F, but they're not connected to each other. Not hydrogen bonding. Some molecules contain an H attached to an H and an O. They are not attached to each other, not hydrogen bonding. Some molecules contain an H and an N, but they are not attached to each other, so it is not hydrogen bonding. It's not good enough to just have an H and an N, or an H and an F, or an H and an O. You have to be attached to each other. On the other hand, if you're not a molecule that contains H attached to F, H attached to O, or H attached to N, then you're dipole-dipole attraction. Before I go on and talk a little bit more about how to tell the difference, I am going to just give you why we need to know the difference. Hydrogen bonding is the strongest of the weak. Okay? It is the strongest of the weak. It's a, the strongest intermolecular force we have. And because it is the strongest of the weak, it can do some pretty cool things like hold DNA strands together or hold RNA to DNA during transcription or hold um, RNA to RNA during translation. Um, it is also why our blood is a liquid at room temperature. It's also why water is a liquid at room temperature. Um, it's also why water expands when it freezes. Uh, I can go on and on and on. So hydrogen bonding is a force to be reckoned with. Um, it's like a super strong case of dipole-dipole. Hydrogen bonding occurs because hydrogen is really small. And so are fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. So small, in fact, and elect so electronegative that their nuclei are very close to the bond. See, in, in fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen are the three smallest highly electronegative elements. All three are very small. Fluorine is the highest in electronegativity. And so the nucleus is so close to the electrons in a bond that it is as close to making a polar bond as you can get between two nonmetals. And so these really, 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 really polar covalent bonds are going to make a really, 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 really big concentration of negative near the fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, and a really strong concentration of positive near the hydrogen. And that's going to cause this like mini magnet situation. So if I put another water in, it'll flip itself around so that the oxygens attract to the H's and the H's attract to the O's. And I'm going to draw that for you right now so that you have some understanding of what I mean. So let's go back to that whiteboard. My water. This water is almost ionic. If it was a crystal, if it was metals and nonmetals, it would be. And that means that the H becomes partially positive and the O is partially negative. Okay, so if I drop another H2O into this, the O's will orient themselves so that they will be closer to H's and the H's will orient themselves so that they are closer to O's and this will result in really strong attractions between molecules. So these are molecules. Each of these is an individual molecule. But hydrogen bonds are between them. And those hydrogen bonds are attractions that hold one water closer to another. If you want to boil the water, then you're going to have to overcome those hydrogen bonds. Remember, when we boil water, we make water vapor. We don't boil water and make hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. We're just merely separating the waters from each other. But to do that, we have to overcome any intermolecular forces they have. And the intermolecular forces of attraction between the hydrogen of one water and the oxygen of another is relatively strong. So, in hydrogen bonding, you're going to have the strongest of these attractions, but dipole-dipole is going to exist in molecules that don't have hydrogen bonding, but that still have a permanently negative and a permanently positive end. And that means that, for instance, HBr. If I take an HBr and I put another HBr next to it, the other HBr will orient itself, and that would be a dipole-dipole attraction. So polar molecule, if it contains hydrogen bonded to an F and O or an N, fine, 
it's hydrogen bonding, strongest of the week. If it doesn't, it's dipole-dipole attraction, which is still reasonable, but not as strong. And then you have nonpolar molecules, which really shouldn't be attracted to each other at all. However, the electrons in bonds are constantly moving. So I want you to think about this like bees, right? So if I, if I let 500 bees loose in this room right now, what are the odds that 250 would be on one half of the room and 250 would be on the other exactly? And the odds of that are very slim. And that's what happens in a nonpolar molecule. Even though overall the charges are offset and, and there's a even distribution of charge, at any given instant, one side will have the electrons further toward it than the other, and therefore one side will become temporarily positive and the other temporarily negative. And that's the key. In a nonpolar molecule, any positive and negative polarity of the molecule is completely temporary. The next instant it could swap and the other side could become positive and negative. And so these molecules have these little fluxes of magnetism that keep them closer to each other than we would think, but not very close at all. So most things that only have van der Waals forces are gases because they're not held together by very strong forces. However, if I have a big enough molecule, there'll be so much van der Waals force that it could be a liquid or a solid. The best example, there are two really good examples of that for me to give you. One is the halogens on the periodic table that we talked about last time. The halogens, F is the smallest halogen, it's a gas. Cl is a little bigger, still a gas. Bromine, bigger and a liquid. Iodine, even bigger and a solid. Another example would be something that you know from your homes. Methane gas is a gas, and ethane is a gas, and propane, as in propane tanks, is a gas. But if you have a butane lighter, which is a cigarette lighter, then you know that butane is a liquid. Why? Because butane has gotten bigger, and a bigger carbo, uh, hydrocarbon will actually have more van der Waals forces, and that's why it's a liquid at room temperature. Intermolecular forces in general are the reason for melting and boiling points. So if something has a really, really low melting point, we know that it probably has van der Waals forces. And if something has a very unusually high melting point, we know that it, might, that it probably has dipole-dipole or even hydrogen bonding. But I want to be clear on this. We're talking about molecules here. Ionically bonded things are crystals. Ionically bonded things don't have intermolecular forces. They have a crystal lattice. And that crystal lattice will hold together it's under, under tremendous circumstances. And that crystal lattice is pretty, pretty strong. And for that reason, when I say that ionically bonded things have high melting points, they have high melting points. When I say things that have hydrogen bonding as molecules have higher melting points, they're still not high. You talk about salts having a, a melting points that are upward of six and 800 degrees, whereas water is 100. Significantly higher than most molecules, yet not nearly as high as a metallic or ionic crystal, because the crystal lattice is in fact stronger and harder to break. Okay, so just to give you a, 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 a little visual that's better than my drawing, if we look at the drawing on the left, we can see the hydrogen bonds between the waters. And um, those waters kind of look like little Mickey Mouse heads, and that is how we draw them. The hydrogens are significantly smaller than the oxygen, but the oxygen is still relatively small. Um, on the upper right, I have ox, um, iodine molecules, and you can see that iodine molecules are dispersion forces because they move around. Um, you can see that the iodine, some of the iodines are positive and some are negative, and that's because those electrons are moving around, kind of like these, making a cloud. And on the bottom right, we can see that the HCl is a polar molecule that is not hydrogen bonding, and we would call that dipole-dipole. Okay, and that pretty much gets me to the end of what I wanted to talk about with bonding. However, as I said when I started today, bonding is an exceptionally abstract part of chemistry, and therefore it's difficult, and I'm going through it very quickly um, in about an hour, I believe. And so uh, if, you, if you need to email me or talk to me about it more, please come to one of my study sessions and ask me for help, and I'd be glad to give it. Okay, chemical symbols. Chemical symbols are the symbols that are listed on the reference table. Um, there are basic symbols, and the basic symbols are the symbols of the elements. We talked about them a little bit last week. These are the symbols that are on the periodic table. They could be one letter, they could be two letters, or they could be three letters. I gave you an example of each on this slide. F is a one-letter symbol, LI is a two-letter, and UUT is a three-letter. But you should note that in all of them, only the first letter is capitalized. Whenever you're looking to count how many different elements 
or different types of atom are in a compound, you're looking for the uppercase letters, only the capitals. Um, elements can exist as molecules, and when they exist as molecules, they are bonded together, but there's still only one type of element. Um, a molecule is a group of atoms that are covalently bonded together. We just established that when we did bonding, and the diatomic molecules spell Brinkelhoff, as you can see from down here. Brinkelhoff, the diatomic atoms. Diatomics are only diatomic when they're alone in nature. So if I, if I were to attach the hydrogen to a bromine, it would be HBr, not H2Br2. But if hydrogen were by itself, it would be H2. And if bromine were by itself, it would be Br2. So the diatomics are only when they exist in elemental form. And you can see down here I wrote out the N2 for you. Okay. Chemical formulas show the relationship between the elements in a compound. So a chemical formula uses subscripts to show us how many of each particle of each element are involved in that specific particle. The subscripts are referring to the ratio. Um, last time I talked about a compound having a definite ratio by mass, the ratio is the subscript. So in an empirical formula, the lowest whole number ratio is shown. Um, it's used for ionic compounds because they're crystals, so it really um, doesn't matter whether I have a large piece of, of NaCl or a small piece of NaCl, it'll have exactly the same properties. It's not about how many Na and Cl ions there are in the NaCl. It's about the ratio of a one-to-one -one Na plus to Cl minus. And so when we talk about ionic things, we talk about empirical formulas because the empirical formula conveys to us all the information we need. A large chunk of sodium chloride could have 100,000 sodiums and 100,000 chlorines, and a small piece could have eight sodiums and eight chlorines, but they're both going to have exactly the same properties, and so we just call it NaCl. On the other hand, molecules, which can exist as individual entities and are not crystals, molecules actually use what we call a molecular formula, which is not reduced. Sometimes a molecule actually is both a molecular and empirical formula, like for instance, CH4, which is methane. CH4 is the actual number of C's and H's in ratio in methane. It is also the empirical formula. But something like glucose, which is C6H12O6, glucose's molecular formula is C6H12O6, but its empirical formula would be CH2O. And silicon decahydride would be si 2 H5 in empirical form. However, that's not how they exist. They exist as molecules with these ratios. Okay. All compounds are neutral. They have to be neutral. We talked a few moments ago about how we have all these dissolved ions in our bloodstream, which makes us conductors called electrolytes. And so since we are full of electrolyte, we can be shocked and electrocuted by things. If compounds weren't neutral, everything we touched would shock us or electrocute us or send an electric charge through our body, and it doesn't, so we know they're neutral. Okay, when a, when a compound is neutral, what that really means is that the negatives and positives offset each other, because there are, in fact, often negatives and positives, but they have to offset each other. In order to determine the ratio in which the charge offsets itself, we use what's called the crisscross method. We write the charge up top and cross them. And I will show you exactly what I mean with NaCl. Na has a charge of plus one, and Cl has a charge of minus one. If I cross the ones, I get Na1, Cl1. We don't write ones, and that's its formula. On the other hand, Mg has a charge of plus two, and Cl has a charge of minus one. If I cross those charges, I would get Mg, Cl, Two. And that is the correct formula for magnesium chloride. The reason that that's the correct formula for magnesium chloride is because if magnesium has a charge of plus two, I need two Cl's with their minus ones, minus one and minus one, to offset it. To name an ionic compound, first you have to make sure it's ionic. And as we talked about a few moments ago, if it's ionic, it's got to be a metal with a nonmetal, a metal with a polyatomic ion, or two polyatomic ions. Um, we change the ending of the nonmetal or the last entity to ide. If it's a polyatomic ion, we just write its name. 
But to name a molecular compound, which is nonmetal, nonmetal, we use prefixes to represent the numbers. This is because molecular compounds can have the same two elements in different ratios, whereas ionic compounds don't. So for instance, I could have CO and I could have CO2. So I would say that CO is carbon monoxide and CO2 is carbon dioxide. Notice that I don't call it monocarbon. And the reason I don't call it monocarbon is that you never start with mono. So we have one more complicated factor. When we look on the periodic table, some metals have only one charge, but other metals have more than one. If a metal has more than one charge, we have to give it a Roman numeral. Um, and so if the nonmetal has more than one charge, it does not matter. If the metal has only one charge, this does not matter. But if a metal has more than one charge, we have to specify. So to specify, you look up the nonmetal, and then you make sure that they're even with the metal, meaning that it's a neutral compound. Not too worried about that at the moment, though, because I'm going to show you how to do it right now. Okay. So there are two reference tables that are relevant when you're talking about polyatomic ions, and table E is the polyatomic ion reference table. So table E is, is actually a list of polyatomic ions with their charges. We will be using that. The other table that is relevant here is the periodic table. Um, this is the periodic table that is given on the regions. Okay, so if you look at this periodic table, you can see the numbers in the upper right-hand corner, and those are the possible or potential charges. So you can see that anything in group one or anything in group two has only one charge, and so we never use Roman numerals for them. Um, you can also look in the transition metals and see some of them, like yttrium and scandium and zinc, also only have one charge. Aluminum only has one charge. Gallium only has one charge. And so we don't need to use Roman numerals for those either. But some of these in the middle, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, have more than one and because they have one uh, tin and lead as well. And because they have more than one, we have to specify with a Roman numeral. So those would be the only ones that we would worry about a Roman numeral with. Notice, though, that amongst the nonmetals, there's lots of numbers. When we're using nonmetals in an ionic compound, they only use their top charge. And so we do not ever use a Roman numeral for a non-metal in standard system IUPAC. By the way, if you see a, qu a question that says IUPAC system, IUPAC, that's just the system I'm showing you. So, zinc carbonate. The first thing I would do if I were going to figure out how to write the formula would be to look up zinc on the table. And if I look up zinc on the table, I'm going to see that zinc has only one charge. Okay, so I can write zinc and I will write it with its one charge. So we've got zinc plus two. And now I'm going to look up carbonate on my polyatomic ion chart. And if I look up carbonate on the polyatomic ion chart, carbonate will be zinc. And then I'm going to put my carbonate, which is a polyatomic ion, in parentheses, minus two. So I'm going to crisscross. I'm going to take this 2 and put it here. I'm going to take this 2 and put it there. I'm going to get Zn, CO3, 2 and 2. And then I'm going to reduce it to Zn, CO3. And that's the correct formula for, carb for zinc carbonate. Um, let's do another one. Let's do aluminum nitrate. OK. so. Aluminum, Al, if you look it up on the periodic table, is plus 3. Nitrate, NO3, is minus 1. So the 1 will go here, and the 3 will go there outside the parentheses. And that will be Al1, which we don't write, NO3, 3. And that means, by the way, that that has 1 aluminum, 3 nitrogens, and 9 oxygens in it. Calcium phosphate. Let's see what we can do with calcium phosphate. Calcium, according to the periodic table, is plus 2. Phosphate is PO4, according to our polyatomic ion chart, minus 3. So we're going to cross the 3, we're going to cross the 2, and we'll get calcium 3, phosphate 2. And we cannot reduce that, so we leave it as is. 3 calciums, 2 phosphates, and 8 oxygens.
sulfur difluoride. Sulfur difluoride has two nonmetals, so we're using the other system now. That di in the system for nonmetals means two. So sulfur is one, and fluorine is difluoride two, SF2. Much easier, I think, in a lot of ways. People just forget to use it. Okay, um, lithium iodide and sodium hydroxide. So let's do lithium plus one, iodine minus one. We are going to cross the charges and we get lithium iodide. Sodium hydroxide, Na plus one, OH minus one. And that's found on the periodic table, and that's found on the polyatomic ion chart, and we end up with NaOH. Okay, and I'm going to do one now that has a Roman numeral. So let's do – let's clear this, and let's do um, iron 2 – sulfate. The two here is referring to the metal. So I can write Fe plus two because I know what that means. And then I have to look up sulfate. Eights and ites are on the polyatomic ion chart. Ides are just the element. So that would be SO4 minus two. And the twos will cancel and we end up with FeSO4. But what if I wanted iron three sulfide. Ide means that it's just sulfur. So this would be Fe plus 3, and the sulfur would be minus 2, and that would give us Fe2S3 as iron 2, 3 sulfide. Okay, the harder end of this is actually finding the polyatomic um, ion char or, or, or charge by looking it up on a table. And so let's do a little bit of this backward stuff. Um, and I'm going to show you on here how to do this. There's sulfur and nitrogen. So I would say that those are both nonmetals. So I would name that tetrasulfur tetranitride. Okay, so on my whiteboard here, let's do LiNO3. Now I want to name this. So I'm going to name it for the metal, lithium. And because lithium's a metal and there's metal in it, it's ionic. So I am not going to use any prefixes. But nitrate is a polyatomic ion. I can look that up on the chart. But let's say instead I, was, I wanted to do, um, that's going to be cobalt sulfide. But cobalt, unlike lithium, requires a Roman numeral. The way I would find the Roman numeral is by looking up the S. The S is minus 2, and that means that the cobalt needs to be plus 2 in order to offset it. So that cobalt would be cobalt 2. Try another one. One more. Let's do um, SNO2. Okay, that's going to be tin, Roman numeral, oxide. But the oxygen is minus 2, which means the overall on the oxygen is minus 4. That means the overall on the sulfur needs to be plus 4, so sulfur is in fact plus 4. So that would be IV. Okay, and again, I know this is a lot of procedural stuff, and so if you're out there and you need some help with it, please, you know, give, drop me an email and we'll work it out. I can do plenty of examples for you, and I can send you examples, so definitely let me know. Okay, moving on. Balancing equations. When we balance an equation, we're actually balancing equations to conserve mass. And if you remember from the last lecture, I can tell you that um, conservation of mass means that when atoms react, they can combine in different ways, but they can't change their identity. In this case, you could see that the CH4 at the beginning contains carbon and hydrogen. And although the carbon and hydrogen split up into different compounds uh, at, in the products, there is still carbon and hydrogen there. So. We also need to have the correct amounts, meaning that I need to have enough oxygen, and I have to put a two there, enough oxygen in order to get carbon dioxide and water. So when we use those big numbers, we call them coefficients. The subscripts are part of the formula. 
oxygen is O2 because it's diatomic and CH4 is um, methane and that's the formula for CH4. So the coefficient applies here to the two oxygen so that there's a total of four oxygens. The coefficient here in the products applies to both the hydrogens and the oxygens. So that would mean that there are four hydrogens and two oxygens in the coefficient of water. Okay, so let's talk about some reactions. There are five basic types of reactions. We're going to go through all five and as we go through them, I'm going to help with a little bit of balancing so that we can kill two birds with one stone. Okay, so the first reaction, three reactions are what we call synthesis reactions. The reason they're synthesis reactions is because you have two things on the left becoming one thing on the right. You got two things on the left becoming one thing on the right. When you have one thing on the right, it's always a synthesis. There are more complicated reactions that are a little bit different than this, but for the purposes of this course, whenever you have one thing on the right of the arrow, it is always synthesis. But the definition of synthesis is that we take two things and we combine them. However, if I look at my first reaction here, I have K and Cl on both sides. And that should be, that's correct. On the left side, I have one K and two Cls. On the right side, I have one K and one Cl. That's a problem. I need them to be equal. And so I'm going to have to put a two here to get two Cls. However, that will change my case to two as well. So I'm gonna have to go back here and put a two here to get to K. Okay. Let's do the next one, another synthesis. The element iron plus the element sulfur makes a compound iron sulfide. I'm going to have to put an eight here to get eight sulfurs, and that means I need an eight here. Um, just to, to let you know, um, this T diagram that I drew, that's the best way to figure out a balancing of an equation if you're not good at it. You can do it for everyone, you could do it for none of them, or you could do it for only the hard ones. That's up to you. But if you're having trouble balancing ever in the beginning, I would do a T diagram for everything. So I'm gonna do another T diagram for this one. I have S's, I have H's, and I have O's on, all, on both sides. On the left, I have one S, I have two H's, and I have four O's. On the right, I have one S, two H's and four O's, and that means that it is in fact already balanced. Notice that you don't write a one in. So if there's no coefficient, we don't usually write one, although it would not be wrong. Okay, so decomp. Decomp is the opposite of synthesis, so I'm gonna start with one thing, and I'm gonna end up on the equation with more than one thing, because I'm breaking the original substance down into smaller pieces. So you can see that all three of the reactions under decomp are characterized by the fact that there is only one substance on the left of the arrow. Um, but to go back and balance, I'm going to have to put a two here to get two oxygens, and that requires me to put a two there. Okay, NaCl becomes Na plus Cl2, and two NAs to get two ACLs on that side, and magnesium carbonate breaks into magnesium oxide and carbon dioxide. That's already balanced. The three other types of reactions. Okay, the single replacement. In the single replacement, I'm always going to have a single thing and a, and a compound. And the single thing is going to replace one of the elements in the compound. Which element will the single thing replace? Well, it will replace something that's like it. So if the single element is a metal, it will replace the metal, which comes first in the compound. So if the single thing is a metal, it replaces the first element in the compound. If the single thing is a non-metal, it replaces the second element in the compound. These reactions don't always happen. So I'm going to give you a little analogy about them and then we'll go to the town and balance them. Okay. So I like to think of a single reaction as if you're dancing with somebody and somebody else comes to cut in. So sometimes when you're dancing with somebody and somebody comes on the dance floor and you know they're going to cut in, you let them. And other times you hang on to the person you're with and you say, please don't let this person in. Please don't let this person in. Please dance to the other side. What distinguishes? Well, it could be looks. It could be personality. But in any event, it has to be that the single person needs to be somehow better than who you're already dancing with or you won't let them cut in. And that's how single replacements work. The single thing must be a more active element, must have a higher reactivity than the thing that it replaces. How do I know if it has a higher reactivity? Well, to determine a higher reactivity, and the specific reference table I'm going to go to is table J. These are the region's reference tables. 
Here's table J. It's called the activity series. You're going to find things. It's very clearly labeled. If you're looking at nonmetals, it's on the right. If you're looking at metals, it's on the left. Notice that hydrogen acts like a metal in these reactions. That's because hydrogen can sometimes be positive and it isn't a single replacement reaction. You can see that it's labeled top, at least on the bottom. And so what you're looking for is the single thing to be more active than the thing it's replacing. The single thing needs to be higher on table J. So to go back to what we were talking about. The thing over yeah. Okay. Mg is higher than Mg. Action happens. I have to put a two here and a two there. Copper is not higher than Fe on table J, so there is no reaction. Zinc is higher than H, and we're good. And to replace chlorine because fluorine is a nonmetal, but it is higher than the chlorine. But that. Okay, double replace. Double are when the, the first two elements in each compound are places. So you can see the AG and the N swap. So the, the AG goes with the CL and the NA comes to the NO3. These reactions will only happen if a solid or water is formed. First one, you can see that there's solid formed. In the second one, you can see that there's water formed. And the last but not least, combustion of a hydrocarbon. It's combustion. It has to have oxygen on the left. Because all oxygens have oxygen on the left. It's a hydrocarbon. So the other substance has to contain carbon and hydrogen. So let's see if that balances out for us. Here we have, in the first one, here we have oxygen, oxygen, and oxygen. Are always requirements, and here we have carbon and hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen. Notice you could have oxygen as well, and, but it's always got to be at least at minimum carbon and hydrogen, and they all make the same thing, carbon dioxide and water. Go to balance, I'm likely to have to balance them, so I'm not going to worry about that at the moment. Next, chemistry is very quantitative, and so there's a lot of math involved in chemical reactions. The math we use in reactions, and let me go back and talk about this a little bit. Okay, when I show you this, if I were to ask you what does it mean, you would say it means that two molecules of water are going to make two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen gas. But the truth is that these numbers don't stand for molecules. If they did, all pharmacists in the world would be out of business and there would be no drug companies because there is no scale that can measure or even see, even on a robotic way, two individual molecules of water. And so those numbers actually are what we call a mole ratio. The mole is the unit of amount used in chemistry. And the mole is going to make, an, is going to, to encompass enough atoms or molecules of the substance that we can actually measure it on laboratory equipment. So what we're going to do is we're going to blow up the atom or the molecule into a number that we're able to measure. That number is called Avogadro's number. And Avogadro's number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd pieces of anything. Now, that's a huge number. And that just goes to show you how small atoms really are. However, it's really like saying a dozen. If I said that I had a dozen elephants, you would say I had 12 elephants. And if I said that I had a dozen donuts, you would say that I had 12 donuts. Do the dozen elephants and the dozen donuts have anything in common other than being 12 of each? No. And that's how the mole works in chemistry as well. The mole is a number of pieces of whatever substance you're referring to. But those, that number of pieces of different substances have vastly different properties, including different mass, different volumes, and so different physical and chemical properties, different densities. And so really when I talk about the mole, I'm really only referring to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. And to make it even harder, there are different kinds of particles in chem. Okay, so when we talk about particles or pieces, we say that the particles are gonna be dependent on their bonding. Particles can be formula units, and the formula units are the basic ratio for an ionic crystal. They're always going to be empirical. Particles could be molecules, but as we said before, molecules refer only specifically to covalently bonded things. 
or particles could just be atoms. Oops, do it again. And just atoms. And that's fine because most things that are atomic are pretty easy to see as atomic, like iron or helium. Okay, so one mole of anything is equal to its formula mass. The formula mass is what we find on the periodic table. So one mole of iron equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of iron. It also equals 55.845 grams of iron. If I go to the periodic table, that it is 55.845, okay. One mole of carbon dioxide, on the other hand, is a molecule. Carbon dioxide, oops, is a molecule. So one mole of carbon dioxide is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of carbon dioxide. But one mole of carbon dioxide contains one mole of carbon atoms, which means it has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon in it. It also contains two moles of oxygen atoms, which means it has two times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of oxygen in it. One mole of carbon atoms, according to the periodic table, is 12 grams. One mole of oxygen atoms, according to the periodic table, is 16 grams. But there are two moles of oxygen atoms in carbon dioxide, so 2 times 16 would be 32 grams. Therefore, if I wanted to know how much the mass of one mole of CO2 would be, it would be the 12 grams of carbon plus the, the 32 grams of oxygen, which would give us 44 grams. So one mole of CO2 is 44 grams of CO2. I know that sounds really quick. This is something that you have to look at the periodic table while you're doing, and it's really not as, as difficult as it sounds, but I'm running through it very quickly. One mole of calcium chloride, now here we have an ionic thing. So one mole of calcium chloride contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of calcium chloride, and each mole of calcium chloride also contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd calcium ions, which is 40.08 grams of calcium ions according to the periodic table. It also contains two times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd chlorine atoms because of the two subscript in the chlorine. Um, that is two times 35.5 or 71 grams of chlorine atoms. And if I wanted to know the mass of one mole of calcium chloride, it would be 40.08 from the calcium plus 71 from the chlorine, which would give me 111.08 grams of calcium chloride. Okay, mole conversions. Like dozens, Moles only give us a number. One dozen donuts has little in common, one dozen elephants, and so just like one mole of iron has little else in common with one mole of oxygen. But we can use moles to make a variety of conversions. So, whenever I'm doing mole conversions, I'm going to take what I'm given, which is gonna be substance A, and then I'm gonna use dimensional analysis. So I'm going to convert that by going with su substance A on the bottom to cancel it and what I want on the top. Okay, so we're gonna do a little practice with this at a moment, but I just first want to explain two things to you. The coefficients of the balanced equation are actually representing moles, and that's a mole ratio between the reactants and the products. We can use those coefficients to determine either how much of something we need before we start a reaction or how much of something we can make with what we already have. So the mole ratio is also illustrating conservation of mass because if we know what's on the left, we will then know what's on the right. So sometimes you can just use a simple mathematical additive relationship to figure out how much of a product is made. But only if, if you are told in the question that the substances reacted completely. Okay, so what does that really mean? What that means is very simple. If the substances react very completely, and if conservation of mass is true, then if I have a reaction like um, CH4 plus O2 
yield CO2 plus H2O. I first have to make sure it's balanced and it's not. I need a two here and then I need a two there. Those are the mole ratios. So I can read that as one mole of CH4 reacts with two moles of oxygen gas to, to make two, one mole of CO2 and two moles of water. Okay. Let's say that I'm told that 25 grams of CH4 reacts completely with 15 grams, oh wait, no, 32, with 28 grams of O2 to make 57, say 50 grams of CO2, then I can determine how much water it makes just by simple addition and subtraction. On the other hand, it could get more complicated than that. And if it gets more complicated than that, we can use simple dimensional analysis. So I'm going to give you an even easier one. Na plus Cl2. You know, it's 2NaCl. Okay. How much NaCl can be made using 50 grams of Na in excess Cl2? Okay. So I have 50 grams of Na. And I have to convert that first to moles of Na. So I'm going to look it up on the periodic table. And the periodic table is going to tell me that there's 23 grams of Na in one mole of Na. And that gets rid of grams of Na, gives me one mole of Na. But my reaction has two moles of Na. And that will make two moles of NaCl. This is called the mole ratio. And one mole of NaCl is 23, 58.5 grams of NaCl. And then I can use my calculator to determine any quant the quantity that I would make. This step is called the mole ratio, and that's a very important step when it comes to chemistry because that's the step that allows you to convert from one substance to a different substance in the reaction. I will definitely um, throw an assignment on there that has some more of that work so you can work through that. And if you're having any trouble with it, I'd be happy to help you. Okay. And that's going to leave us with the end of this lecture, which is going to be the end of the math unit, determining an empirical and a molecular formula. Okay, so if I want to determine the empirical and molecular formulas of things, I'm going to do that by looking at data. And the data can tell me a variety of different things because the data can tell me the, the actual mass ratios and I have to then convert them. The difference between the empirical and molecular formula, again, remember, is that empirical formulas are formulas that are reduced to their lowest term and molecular formulas are not reduced. So let's look at a few problems. In any event, the hardest of these problems would be to start with data, convert to an empirical formula, and then have to find a molecular formula. So I gave you kind of an outline of how we would solve these problems, but let's look at these problems. Okay, let's do an empirical formula first. I have a substance that is 88% copper and 11.2% oxygen. Okay, so the first step on the PowerPoint is the first step I'm going to accomplish here, and that is that I'm, I have to convert whatever information I'm given, percent, number of atoms, grams, I'm going to convert whatever I'm given into moles. So when I want to convert percents into moles, I can assume that this particular substance had a 100 gram mass, and if it had a 100 gram mass, it would be 88 grams of copper and 11.2 grams of oxygen. 
So I'm going to convert those to moles. How do I do that? 88 grams of copper, and I want to convert it to one mole of copper, which means I'm going to have to divide it by copper's mass. Where do I find the mass? I find that mass when I go on to the periodic table. And the mass of copper on the periodic table, copper's right here, it's 63.5. Sixty three point five grams of copper. Now I can do that on my calculator and I'm going to give you two seconds to do that on your calculator so that you can follow along and that would be one point three eight five eight. I usually go to four decimal places. Now I have to do the same thing with the oxygen. The oxygen is eleven point two grams of oxygen. And if we go back to our periodic table, we can scroll over to oxygen and see that oxygen's mass is approximately 16. So one mole of oxygen is 16 grams of oxygen. And so when you plug that into your calculator, you would get 0.7. Now the next step is to divide both of those numbers by the lower one. The lower one in this case is 1.3858. That'll leave us with one here, and that'll leave us with 0.5 here. And so my ratio is CuO.5, but I can't leave it that way because we only use whole, rate, whole number ratios in empirical formula. So to make the 0.5 a whole number, I would have to multiply it by 2, and that would give me Cu2O. And that is the empirical formula using that data. Hopefully that made a bit of sense. I'm going to do another one right now. And let's see what we have here. I'm going to give you a little harder one. We'll do 40% carbon, 6.7% hydrogen. and 53.3% oxygen. So we're going to start the same way. Percents are the same as grams, so I could literally just call those grams. So I can say 40 grams of carbon times one mole of carbon is 12 grams of carbon. 6.7 grams of hydrogen times one mole of hydrogen is one gram of hydrogen. And 53.3 grams of oxygen times one mole is 16 grams of oxygen. And that will give me 6.7 for the hydrogen. And let's do our calcs for the others. So for the others, we're going to get 3.333 and 3.3. Three point three three, and so I'm going to divide everything by three point three three because that's the smallest of the numbers, and that's going to give me one and six point seven divided by three point three three is. 2.01 and 1, and I can scrap the 0 0.01 because it's a 0, 0.0. I can round up on a 0 0.9, and I can subtract on, and I can round down on a 0, 0.0. If you got a 2.3, you'd be in a little bit of a trouble, and that would be a pain, and you'd have to multiply it out, but that rarely happens. And so our ratio here is 1 to 2 to 1. So the answer to the question is CH2O. Now let's say that I told you that the CH2O has a molecular mass of 180 grams. Now you have to find the molecular formula. To find the molecular formula, let me erase the top. We don't need much room. I'm going to use the second half of that slide's procedure, and I'm going to say that 
the empirical mass, the mass of this, is 12 plus 1 times 2 plus 16. So that's going to be 16, 18, 28, 20, 30. So that's going to be 30. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 180 divided by 30, and that's going to give me 6. And then I'm going to take my empirical formula and multiply all the subscripts by 6. So C6H12O6 is my molecular formula. Okay, one more. Let's try one more. 7.19% phosphorus and 92.81% bromine. Okay, so we're going to go to our periodic table and we're going to look up phosphorus and bromine. Phosphorus is 31 and bromine is 80. So we're going to go 31 and 80 um, ten to the tenths, or the whole number is usually the way to go. So this is 31, and this is 80 based on the periodic table. So we're going to say 7.19 grams of phosphorus times one mole of phosphorus over 31 grams of phosphorus, and 92.81 grams of bromine times 80 grams of bromine is one mole of bromine. And I will give you a minute to start calculating, just a minute, and then I will do it as, I will write it out for you. Okay, so my answer then would be PBr5. Now, if the molecular mass equals 1,293, I'm going to find the molecular formula. So the first thing I need to do is I need to figure out the empirical formula. So I'm going to say 1,293 divided by the empirical formula. So the empirical formula would be 1 times 31 plus 4, oh, I'm sorry, 1 times 31 plus 5 times 80, which gave me 431. So if I divide 1291 by 431, that will give me 2.99, which is approximately 3. So the molecular formula is P3Br15. Okay. So let me recap everything that we did with the math. Okay. The mole is really just a measurement or a unit that we devise to have a big enough number that we can measure it on a normal scale. And that number, discovered by Avogadro using gas laws, was 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd pieces of anything. And so one mole is 6.02 times 10 to 23rd pieces of anything, but sometimes those pieces can be broken into smaller pieces. So for instance, if you look to the right again, the moles of iron are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of iron, but because carbon dioxide and calcium chloride have more than one piece in them, one mole of carbon dioxide is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of carbon dioxide, but we can break that into other pieces. And we can say that it's also 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon and 12.04 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of oxygen. And we can do the same thing with the calcium chloride. Um, the other thing we can determine using moles is that one mole has a certain mass, and that mass is the mass on the periodic table. So when, to find the mass of iron, I just simply looked up iron on the periodic table, 55.845. To find the mass of carbon dioxide, however, I had to look up both carbon and oxygen, and then I had to double the oxygen because there are two oxygens in one unit of carbon dioxide. So it would be 12 plus 2 times 16. 
similarly to find the calcium chloride, I had to look up both the calcium and the chlorine, and then I had to multiply the chlorine by two. Um, when you're doing this, there are also sometimes different labels, and that's really a semantic thing. If it's just iron, we're going to call it atoms. But if it's CO2, we call it molecules because it's covalently bonded because they're both nonmetals. And if it's calcium chloride, we call it formula units because those are ions because that's ionically bonded because it's a metal with a nonmetal. The final thing that I did not talk about and saved for last was that when you're talking about bonding, and I will go back to bonding, when you're talking about bonding, an ionic compound that includes a polyatomic ion has both ionic oops, and covalent bonding. It's considered to be an ionic compound, and it should be brittle, and it should be a crystal, so it should have a lattice with a high melting point, but it is considered to have both types of bonding. I'll give you an example. Um, magnesium hydroxide. The O and the H in the hydroxide are covalently bonded together, but the OH is ionically bonded to the magnesium, or potassium permanganate. The permanganate is bonded together, and then it's ionically bonded to the potassium. Um, these compounds, although they have both types of bonding, are still considered to be ionic compounds. They are still crystals, and they are still ionic compounds, so do not confuse them with covalent things. Covalent things are going to be things that are only covalently bonded, and they exist as molecules, so they're going to have lower melting and boiling points, even when they're solids, except for network solids. Network solids, there we go, okay, are covalently bonded solids that have very, very specific pro properties. They are covalent, covalently bonded crystals. But they can only work, they can only happen when you're covalently bonding something that has four valence electrons, because the four valence electrons are going to allow it to bond in a network or to keep bonding to itself over and over and over again. So it, it, it is very specific substances. Diamond, which is all carbon, silicon dioxide, and silicon carbide. Carbon and silicon are right next to each other on the periodic table, and that's because they both have four valence electrons each, and so they can make networks of covalent bonds. These are an anomaly. They are not a typical molecular solid. That's why they have a special name. Because they are an anomaly and are not a network solid, um, the issue for them is going to be that they have very different properties than most molecules. They have very high melting and boiling points. As a matter of fact, it's really hard to melt a diamond. And they are hard. And they are used in motherboards, on computers and such, PVC piping, such. Okay. So, to recap. Okay. So, we have these two types of energy, potential and kinetic, and they, the potential, potential is the form that is in a chemical bond. In terms of that, bonds are, when they form, are all exothermic, and that's because a bond only forms to become more stable. That's why some things can't bond with each other, because they would not become more stable. That means bond association is always endothermic, and energy needs to be added to break a bond. Most of the elements on the periodic table do not have a noble gas configuration, and that's what they're trying to get, and that's why they bond in the ways that they bond. Um, there are three types of bonding. Metallic bonding is what happens with metals. They're just metals. They lose their valence electrons and create a sea of delocalized valence electrons that are mobile, and that's swimming around the, the positive kernels. The kernels are positive because they've lost their valence electrons. This gives metallic bonds all their properties, malleable, ductile, luster, high melting point. 
high melting point because of the crystal lattice. Ionic bonds also have a crystal lattice, so they're also going to have a high melting point. But they are electrolytes, which means they can't always conduct. They don't have moving electrons. But when you dissolve them or melt them, they do have moving ions, which will allow them to conduct, but only in those phases as a solid or an aqueous solution. These solids are brittle, and they are always called salts. Most of um, our ionically bonded compounds exist in solid form. Liquid ionic compounds would be considered lava or magma. Covalently bond, covalent bonds, covalently bonded things are sharing electrons. They can share equally and we call it a nonpolar covalent bond or they could share unequally and we call it a polar covalent bond. Nonpolar and polar covalent bonds are judged by electronegative difference and we can't judge the molecule by the bond. But nonpolar and polar covalently bonded things are all sharing electrons and they all have low melting points and they are all soft if they're solids and they are all poor conductors and we call them molecules, except there are network solids that are also covalently bonded, but they have networks of covalent bonds. They have to contain carbon and silicon because they have to have something that can make four bonds in order to network itself, but they have very unique properties, including a very high melting point because they have the lattice and the covalent bond. Okay, we drew some Lewis structures, and we talked about molecular polarity. Polar molecules, which can dissolve in water, are the kinds of molecules that have a permanently positive end and a permanently negative end. Nonpolar molecules do not have permanently positive and negative ends. Um, intermolecular forces are what determines melting point and boiling point. Um, if it's something is a polar molecule, it can have hydrogen bonding if it contains HF or HO or HN, or if it doesn't, it's dipole-dipole, which is a bit weaker, much weaker than hydrogen bonding. If it, if it is a nonpolar molecule, it has only van der Waals forces, which means that it has to, would have to be very large to be a solid, because most things with van der Waals forces are actually um, gases and liquids because van der Waals are very weak. Okay, and here's some examples. And then we did some chemical symbols and we talked about how to do, how to write compounds. And remember, if it's a molecule, we're gonna use these mono, di, tri, tetra prefixes. And if it's a, a, not a molecule, it's an ion. And if it's an ion, we are going to use the system of metal ide or metal polyatomic ion. Uh, we did a few of those, and I taught you how to find Roman numerals. Remember, if you're looking for Roman numeral, that you have to judge by the nonmetal or polyatomic ion. Don't look up the metal on the table. If you look up the metal on the table, you're very likely to be wrong. And then we did some reactions. Reactants and products need to be balanced because of conservation of mass, and there are five basic types of reactions. Synthesis, decomposition, single replacement, double replacement, and hydrocarbon combustion. And finally, we talked about how the coefficients in the balanced equation are actually reflecting the mole ratio between the different su substances in the reaction, and that that mole ratio is going to help us to convert between substances so that we can figure how much to use or how much we can make when we're doing actual chemical reactions. There are two types of formulas. There are empirical formulas. Ionic things use exclusively empirical formulas. And then there's molecular formulas. The molecular formulas are used by um, molecules. That's why they say molecular. And when you hear the word molecular, you should think covalent. Um, ionic compounds are determined from data by converting whatever data you're given, usually a percent, which you can consider grams, into moles using the periodic table to look up the mass of each element, dividing all the mole values by the lowest number of moles and making it a whole number ratio. And molecular formulas are determined by looking up the, or, or determining the empirical formula and then finding the empirical mass and dividing molecular mass times empirical mass and using that number to um, adjust the subscripts in the formula in order to be a molecular formula. And that is lecture two. Please, call, please email me or come to my extra help if you need any help with this at all. It's very difficult to do a lot of this math work without actually writing it out. So please feel free to get in touch and let me know if I can help you in any way. Have a good day.